This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Arrow 3271's Lecture 17. And in this lecture, we're going to study the stability of flat sheets. Now, we already learned about the stability of columns back in Arrow 3261. And because that's covered with lectures there, and in the Aerospace Strength Handbook Volume 1, we're not going to cover that again. What I'm going to encourage you to do is go and review the lecture and video from Arrow 3261 on the stability of columns. Then review the Arrow 3261 lecture and video on interaction equations, which you should also have mastered in Arrow 3261. Then watch this video on the stability of flat sheet. This will help you to understand the slight change that we will need to make in order to analyze the stability of flat sheets. The good news is we're going to find that if we followed the approach that was recommended in Arrow 3261, that the content is fairly straightforward and only slightly different. So, in Arrow 3261, we investigated the differential equation for the bending of beams, given right here. We see that the deflection, the second derivative of the deflection, is equal to the moment over EI. And we saw, used that equation to solve any time we had a column uh, loaded in compression. Now this was identified as the differential equation which really covered uh, long columns, slender columns. But really it's valid for any time we have an axial loading when we only have uh, some kind of constraint at the ends. Any time we have a member that's only constrained at the ends, we can use this equation. Now if the, uh, if the part is constrained along the length, for example, a stringer attached to skin. We often, the way we will handle this is we will use this differential equation, what we learned about the stability of columns, to solve it. But because the skin restrains the thing, the stringer, from buckling in the skin, in this tangent to the skin direction, in the direction shown, but it doesn't really add much stiffness in the out of plane direction about that axis. What we will do is calculate properties, the I of the section about that tangent axis, and then we can evaluate stability and the stability that we are measuring when we use that I value is that out of plane stability. For an aircraft where we have stringers carrying most of the axial load, we will typically take the frame spacing as our length. We will generally assume pinned supports at the ends of that stringer. We will calculate the section properties of the stringer perpendicular to the skin or about a tangent axis and that will tell us whether that stringer buckles out of plane. That's how we handle the stability of columns. Once again, the difference here is that the columns that we are analyzing uh, are only supported at the ends. Now, whenever we have other supports, then we're going to need a different equation. For example, if we have a thin plate loaded in bending. But if we look at this plate for a moment, let's just imagine that this plate is located, let's say, for our skin stringer idealization. So here's our fuselage. Here are the longerons or stringers. And we have a frame spacing. Now we already saw in uh, 3261 how we can analyze each individual stringer for the axial load it develops. 
but we can also analyze the skin for the load it develops. So if we just focus on one of the skin panels, such as this one shown here, and if we look at the moment acting on the two edges, this is a distributed moment, which means inch pounds per inch. That's what this moment is, inch pounds per inch. So we actually have a moment about the y-axis acting along these edges and a moment acting about the uh, x-axis. It looks like we have a typo here. This is mx about this axis here and here on these two edges. We can write the differential equation for the deflection in the same manner we did before. But now we're going to have a deflection which we're calling w. This is the deflection as that was and we see the second derivative of the deflection with respect to both the x dimension and the y dimension. What this means is we have a differential equation that defines how this beam deflects in the x direction and how the beam deflects in the y direction. So we're talking this direction and this direction. If we only had supports along the edges, like along the x edges, then we would only get this behavior and we can actually treat this with a differential equation for a column. If we only had restraint at the ends along the y-axis here and here, we could use the column equations to evaluate the deflection going like this. However, for this to act like a plate, not only is it going to be thin, but we will find out we have some kind of edge constraint along all edges. Now this is true when we actually have a, a restrained rectangular plate. It's also true when we have a continuous skin like our little idealization here and we're just taking out one piece of that continuous skin and analyzing it. We can treat that like a single panel with some kind of edge constraint. Often we will assume pinned edges or we could say a hinge because when we're talking about a pin along a length that would be acting like a hinge. So when we have constraints along all four axes we don't only have bending in the one direction or in the other direction we find we have bending in both directions at once. What that means is the constraint along the x-axis at the two edges constrains the bending motion along from that one end to the other and the constraints along the ends along the y-axis constrains bending also and the combination of those two defines the total bending solution. We can see out here near the corners where we're really close to both constraints we're going to have less deflection. Out here in the middle where we're furthest from both we'll see the most deflection. Now that all sounds pretty cool philosophically but what we really have here are these two differential equations which look quite similar to what we saw before. We have a differential equation representing the moment and once again this moment is inch pounds per inch and that's related to the second derivative of the deflection with respect to x and the second derivative of the deflection with respect, respect to y. Since this x is mx is loading about the x-axis and is restrained uh, based on that, we can see the deflection is most dominant by that second derivative of the deflection with respect to x. But because this is a continuous plate, we get Poisson's effect, which also constrains the y direction a little bit. So the moment is subject to this differential equation where we'll introduce this stiffness constant here, this bending stiffness. Now remember for a column, our bending stiffness is just E and I. I represents how much resistance to bending the area has and E represents how much the material uh, either contributes or decontributes to that. The D will include both of those terms for a plate and we'll look at that momentarily. We're going to get this a similar equation for the moment about the Y the moment about the y, once again this is a running moment which means inch pounds per inch. We've got the bending stiffness for that direction. We have the 
deflection with respect to the second derivative of the deflection with respect to y and the second derivative of the deflection with respect to x. This prepares us to analyze the beam. So here is our stiffness. Now recalling for a rectangular plate, the moment of inertia is 1 12th b h cubed. What that means is the bending stiffness of a thin plate around its centroid will be 1 12th b t cubed since that height dimension is actually the thickness. Now when we look at this flexural rigidity D, we see that basically then is like the EI of the panel because we can see the E in that equation and we can see the I which is 1 12th B T cubed. Now this flexural rigidity is not the total rigidity of the entire skin. What it is, is the rigidity per unit inch. And that's why there's no B dimension in that moment of inertia. Because this, while the E, the I is the total I of the entire section, or if we had a rectangle of the entire rectangle, this D is the bending stiffness per unit inch. So if we focused on a single unit inch, one inch of the material, that would be the bending stiffness in that inch, which means the more material we have, the more bending stiffness we have. Just like the more distance we have, the more moment we have, since our moment is inch pounds per inch. So if we just focus on one inch, we can say we've got a certain moment per inch, we have a certain rigidity per inch, and now we're being consistent. So really this is the EI with the B taken out since this is a per inch value and then there's one over the term and that's this little one minus nu squared where nu is Poisson's ratio and basically that's called the plate effect. Whenever we have a continuous plate, remember we saw if we load in one dimension, right, our strain is, is just given by Hooke's law. In the other direction, Poisson's ratio says how much strain occurs. In the same way, because the plate has one dimension stiffening the other and the other dimension stiffening the first, that Poisson's ratio, this 1 minus nu squared, we're going to see this term for a lot of equations anytime we're dealing with continuous thin plates or thin plates that are supported on all edges. So that's going to become a very popular term or a common term that we're going to see. Does that make sense so far? Great. Think about that until you think you've got it and then we can move onward. We could say then that the EI is equivalent to the, to the flexural rigidity. We could say then that the EI is just equal to DB where D is the flexural rigidity and B is the width of the plate. Another way of thinking of that is the flexural. Another way of thinking about that is that the flexural rigidity is just the E I over B, or the E times the I divided by the width of the plate. These are common relations that we will use for to support what we're going to do when we evaluate stability of plates and shells. And later, if you come back for composites, we will look at this further and. If you come back for finite elements, we will do a little bit with this as well. Now, when we have these two equations, the solution for the deflection, once again, our W is our deflection, can be given through a Taylor series expansion where we're going to have a summation in each direction of some coefficient with a sine uh, term of each. And if we go and plug in our boundary conditions and simplify this, we can write it this way. Our max deflection is given by this mother here. The total deflection or maximum deflection is some constant over some pi constant with the flexural rigidity and a summation for each of the modes according to this guy. Now this is just a general derived equation that generally you won't uh, derive until you get to say master's work if then
we're just going to take this and note it and use the solutions from this to do a lot of good work. We're not going to really focus deeply on where this comes from other than to take advantage of the work of others and learn how to dispatch practical stability problems in a simple and direct fashion. So this was our deflection equation and if we look at a plate that's loaded in one dimension. Now remember if we had a loading like this plate that you see here, it's got dimensions A and B. Usually B will be the short dimension when we're dealing with plates. Sometimes it's the loaded dimension. What that means is if you look at this B dimension you can see that the loading is applied along that dimension. So that's called the loaded dimension. The A dimension you can see is not loaded, it's loaded perpendicular to that. For some of the stability equations, B is the short dimension. For some of them, it's the loaded dimension. In this particular case, it happens to be the B is both the loaded and the short dimension. With that said, the general equation for a axially loaded beam or a plate with that said, if we have a plate of dimensions A, B, and it has an end load, then this is the differential equation if we have simple supports on all four edges. Now, if we're only supported at the two edges that are loaded, the two ends of the plate, then uh, we don't need this differential equation. We can go back to the differential equation that we used back in arrow 3261 for a column. Even though this is a plate, because it's not restrained along the edges, we can treat it like just an axial column. But if it has constraints on all four edges or three of the four edges, then it goes under plate action and we will need a differential equation such as this one. Our critical load for this case can be shown to be this. Now here we see n sub x critical, which means the running load, the critical running load. If you exceed that critical running load, you will buckle. It's a function of the mode shape. So remember with buckling of columns, we saw a term n, which basically was our mode shape. And for a rectangular panel, we're going to often get two coefficients like you see in that differential equation above m and n. And sometimes we can simplify that down to a single coefficient here where we see m plus 1 over m a squared over b squared quantity times pi squared flexural rigidity over a squared. Now we're actually not going to use this equation. We're going to go further. This looks a lot like our critical buckling load. Once again we see the ei and remember d is just ei over the width which means that d is equal to EI over that B dimension. So this is analogous to the critical buckling load. This is uh, that we got from uh, columns. We can write this in this manner. We can take all this stuff, this M plus 1 over M A squared over B squared squared term and just dump all of that into a constant K and you can see we've adjusted this a little bit so now we've dropped that b squared into the bottom so that a squared went into that k where k is written as we see here and if we focus on how that what that actually means and how it works we can see this little equation this little graph up at the top what we're plotting here is the k versus the A over B ratio, so the long over the short dimension or the length over the width dimension. And this equation here for the critical buckling allowable with this constant here basically says if you go into the first mode, now our lowest allowable will happen when M equals 1. When M equals 1, that beam, the critical uh, the coefficient for buckling that goes into this equation here is actually given by this curve. Now that means that it will fail based on that relationship. So depending on your A over B, if your A over B is really small, you'll see a very high buckling allowable as this point would show. 
as you increase the buckling the a over b ratio your buck your buckling coefficient is going to drop to some minimum value and then if you have a larger a over b ratio and usually that is corresponding with like a square panel and then if you keep increasing it your buckling coefficient is going to increase now if the beam is or the plate is restrained so that it cannot buckle in that first mode like somebody's holding it or something is there to hold it it will go into the second mode which is shown here if that's also restrained it will go into the third mode if that's restrained it will go into the fourth mode now if you want to understand what the critical buckling allowable is you would look at all the modes which basically means you're taking the lowest of all these curves so looking at all these curves you would follow along this path till you get to here and then back down till you get to here back down till you get to here and so on this kind of looks like a ball bouncing you'll notice it's like a ball that's going bing 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 bing, 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 bing. right and you'll notice that the coefficient basically is aiming toward four for this axial compression acting on the column so once again what makes this a plate is this restraint on all four edges which means we have a pin support here 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 and here and that's why this differential equation is effective rather than our beam column deflection that we saw in 3261 and for that loading with this kind of constraint we're going to see a relationship like this which basically is going to be four or a little more. K is going to be four or more. Four or more. We can write a poem about that. Okay? Now this is valid for what? For axial loading. We could call it uniaxial loading because it's axial loading acting only in one direction. And plates, which means we have supports on more than the two opposite ends of the thing. Okay, we're going to get different coefficients when we have different loading and different coefficients when we have different constraints. We can also write this as a stress since that was a running load. It's just N over T, which we can write this way. This is actually the more common way we're going to see this relation for plates. We're going to see a K with a pi squared e over 12 1 minus nu squared which is our plate factor and then we're going to have a t squared over b squared now often that what we're going to divide by is the length right that's what we saw with columns the squared value in the denominator was the length but when we're talking about plates as we saw up above on this very slide the length is sometimes pushed into that k since it's a function of a over b ratio that a over b ratio has both the length and the width dimension and the reason the b is shown in the denominator here rather than the length is what we're going to find out is that the width the shorter dimension tends to be more dominant when we're talking about stability what does that mean well let's say we have a column a thin column what that means is loaded like this what that means since we're calling it a column it means it only has pin supports at the two ends once again this behaves like a column from 3261 and the bending behavior is going to be like this now if we instead have a plate loaded in the same way and it's plate meaning it's pin supported on all four edges now what happens is as you add this axial compression it's trying to buckle like this and it's that buckling is also restrained in this dimension because of the side supports now if you make a more narrow column loaded the same way what happens is it's trying to go into this long mode but this short mode constrains it and since it's constraining it in the short dimension this was trying to go into this big buckling mode like this but it can't because of the restraint going the other direction so what happens is that throws it into a higher mode which is the has the effect of moving from a lower mode to a higher mode so actually that length over width ratio the a over b ratio 
that's shown here actually has all of that effect and it's all buried in the K that we're using. So what the plate effect does is it drops all of that in. So you've got to be careful when you're looking at this equation to make sure you're populating the right stuff. You need to find the right curve for the edge constraints. This one was for a simply supported plate. We're going to need the pi squared. That's not changing. The E of the material, great. 12 is not changing. 1 minus nu squared is not changing, where nu is Poisson's ratio once again. T is just the thickness, because that's what constrains it, buckling out a plane. And B in this particular case is the loaded dimension, or the short dimension. Okay, So we've got to be alert for what all of our terms are. Sometimes that will be a length term, but for thin plates loaded uniaxially, that B is our width dimension or our loaded dimension. Okay, got that? So with that said, we're ready to move onward. When we have uniaxial compression, we're going to use this form of the equation. Everything we saw on the previous slide and on the upper part of the slide are basically for review. This is our equation, our critical buckling stress. This is the stress now and not the force is pi squared E over 1 minus nu squared 12 T squared over B squared. And all those values are shown below. And over here to the right you see three pictures showing how a column deflects versus how a plate deflects and this is a a plate that's shown with three simple supports rather than four and how a plate with four simple supports deflect as I drew a moment ago. And we're not going to use this slide this uh, chart up uh, that we saw above we're not going to use this one for anything we just developed this to understand what we're doing and we're not going to use any of this crap which was just to help us lay the groundwork we're going to use this equation for the critical buckling load of plates loaded uniaxially we're going to get our buckling coefficient from this curve right here which is in your handbook we're going to go calculate the A over B ratio, find the point, and then read the graph. And we've got, you'll notice we have different constraints. Now all of these are plates, which means all of these have constraints on, on uh, the ends and one or more of the sides. All of these, the solid lines shown in the graph, represent when we have pinned ends. So we're talking uniaxial buckling. And for all of these, we have pinned ends whenever we see a solid line in the graph. And you'll notice there's a little symbol showing what the other two side edge restraint is. In this case, it's clamped clamped, which means it's fixed. We're going to use that symbol C for clamped, which is the same as saying it's fixed or built into stone. We're going to use this SS as shown here whenever it's a simple support, which we can also call a pinned support. Okay? And this F doesn't mean fixed that we see here. What that means is free. So that means this particular one has a pinned edge or hinged edge. It has a hinged edge. It has a that's a simple support and it has a free edge. This one is simple, simple, free, clamped. Simple, 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 clamped, simple, clamped. Simple, simple, clamped, simple. Got that? That's all the solid lines in these curves. Now, you'll see these dashed lines, and what those correspond to is when our two edges are clamped, our two ends. So remember, all the solid lines are when the two ends are simply supported, all the dash line are when the two ends are, clam are clamped. And for those we see, that means case A, the dash line case A, is when all four edges are clamped. Case E, the dash line, represents when our two ends are clamped, the one side is simply supported and one side is free. 
Got that? That's how this graph works. And we're going to use it to get our stability constant for this equation. This equation applies for what kind of loading? Uniaxial compression. And what kind of edge support does it give? Any edge support that matches A, B, C, or D in the table, the uh, figure for spring constants for uh, in the table for coefficients of buckling. Got that? Okay, let's go to the next type of panel we might see. All the rest of the equations are going to be analogous to that first equation. The differential equations to develop them are perhaps more complicated, but that doesn't matter to us because somebody's done the work already. If we have a rectangular plate, which means we have supports on more sides, loaded in shear, we're going to use this equation, which basically says the compressive buckling allowable strength is that coefficient of buckling, k sub s, that we're going to get from this table over to the right, or this figure to the right, times, so k sub s times pi squared e thickness squared b. Now in this case, b is our short dimension. And we have our 1 minus nu squared and our 12. We're going to use this curve over here, which says basically if all four edges of the panel are clamped, we're going to use this upper curve. If all four edges are simply supported or hinged, we will use this lower curve. Got it? Okay, that's how that works. If we have a different loading, which basically means that we have a plate loaded in edgewise bending, think for example, if we have a plate with a bending moment like this, then this equation applies. We need our buckling coefficient. We're going to get it from that graph and all the rest of the stuff you can see B for this one is the loaded dimension. You'll see that's the loaded dimension. That's the B value we're going to use. And here what we see, this is a little hard to read, we have a bunch of buckling coefficients as a function of epsilon. Now the way we're going to use this in this class, we're going to use this epsilon as a percent fixed. So what that means is something that is infinitely fixed is clamped. So this upper curve means so once again, you can see we've got the end here is simply supported. The end here is simply supported. And this edge and this edge have some other fixity. Now, if it were simply supported, we could use the curve. Uh, if it's simply supported, that means our, our percent of fixity is going to be zero. So this curve here corresponds with simple supports. This infinite curve corresponds with clamped supports, clamped sides, and everything in between we're going to consider as a percentage. This means it's 100% clamped. This means it's 1% clamped, 5% clamped, 10% clamped, and so on. So basically, uh, often when we're handling these kind of problems, we will assume it's simply supported. We will occasionally assume it's clamped. However, you should also be able to estimate what the buckling coefficient is for any other percent fixity. And the way we're going to use this is by pretending that that epsilon is a percentage clamped. So if we have a thin plate loaded in shear, we're going to use this equation, the upper equation with the upper curve. If we have a thin plate loaded in edgewise bending, we're going to use a lower equation with the lower curve. So the three equations we just saw, we saw a buckling allowable for uniaxial loads, we saw a buckling allowable for shear, and a buckling allowable for in-plane bending. If we have either any of those stresses in any of those directions acting all by themselves,
we will write our margin of safety by calculating the critical buckling allowable, calculating the corresponding stress and writing a margin of safety. If we have more than one of those loads at the same time, like shear and bending, axial load and bending, axial load and shear, we will need to combine our loads. And the way we're going to do that for stability is through interaction equations. This is a really good time to go back to what was presented in Aero 3261 in the Aerospace Strength Handbook Volume 1 and the corresponding lecture and videos to understand how interaction equations are used. So you should understand at this point what the stress ratio is, what interaction equation is, what a closed form margin of safety for a given interaction equation means, and how to calculate margins of safety for interaction equations. Go back and do that now. Once you've done that, you can return to this video and complete uh, what we're going to do. Once you have reviewed interaction equations, you're ready to look at how loading is combined for panels when we're talking about stability. Once again, stress ratios are just the ratio of the applied stress to the allowable. The interaction equation for the stability of a plate, a thin plate loaded in axial compression and shear is given by this equation. And this equation, RC plus RS squared equals 1, corresponds with the margin of safety equation shown at right. This equation can be used for any axial load, which means both compression and tension. The way that's done is by noting that if we have a panel or a plate, panel is another common word, we're going to use that for that, loaded uniaxially, let's say we have simple supports on all four edges. We, we know we can calculate the stress, the compressive stress P over A, and we can calculate the compressive critical buckling allowable, which means the stress ratio is given by that equation. Now if instead we had a tension on the panel, that same exact panel, we can calculate a compressive stress. The compressive stress in that case is going to be negative. It's negative because that's not compression, that's tension. When we write our stress ratio, we're going to get is F critical and we've got a negative FC because we have tension. What that's going to end up doing is giving you a negative stress ratio RC. So if you have compression, you're going to get a positive value of RC going here and here. If you have tension, you're going to get a negative value of RC going here and here. And what that will end up doing is it will show that actually if you have shear alone, you may be critical for stability, but if you have compression also, it will make that stability worse. And if you have tension also, it will actually improve the capability of the panel to withstand buckling. For example, this panel will buckle only for compression. This panel will buckle only for shear. This panel will see a lower buckling allowable margin of safety because it's loaded in both shear and axial load, axial compression, those are going to combine to create a smaller or even negative margin of safety. This panel right here actually may still buckle if our shear stress is great enough, but it will have a higher uh, it will have more resistance to buckling than this panel here because this one has that tension which is stiffening the panel. And the way we're going to see that is because that tension is going to give you po uh, negative values in RC both these places which is going to tend to give you more resistance to buckling.
buckling. Got that? We're going to see this concept of negative compression for tension loads in a few places in our investigation of stability. So make sure you understand that topic. We already said this, that's how that works. We said this, that's our, str our stress ratio when we have tension and we see, we talked about how that bolstered the margin of safety. If we have shear with bending, this is our interaction equation and our margin of safety is given by this equation. Once again, we don't know, need to go to an interaction curve because we have a closed form margin of safety equation. If we have compression with bending, then we have this interaction equation. And since there is not a closed form interaction equation for that, we're going to use the interaction equation shown over to the right. Now the actual interaction equation is given uh, here. This curve actually has more information than we usually get on interaction equations, interaction curves. This equation here corresponds with this curve shown here. And if we have a point, we could just plot our point. Let's say we have our bending stress ratio and our compression stress ratio. If we normally did that, we would draw that point. We would draw a line through the point and we would measure this dimension versus this dimension to get our margin of safety minus one, right? However, you'll notice that this curve is even more powerful than that. Why? Because you'll notice that this curve is actually got more information than a normal interaction equation. Remember, a normal interaction equation is just going to have this zero margin of safety line. But you'll notice that this particular curve has been augmented. So if you fall anywhere between this line here and this line here, you don't need to plot your point as we would for a point here. If we have a point here, we've got to plot our point and calculate our margin of safety by the relative proximity to the curve, the zero margin curve. However, if we end up plotting any point in here or here or here, we can just report the margin of safety by interpolating on the table. For example, this point looks like our margin of safety is somewhere between point two and 0.3, so we could say that's about a margin of safety of about 0.23. This point here looks like it's a 10% margin of safety, 0.10. This point here has a margin of safety of, it looks like about 0.28. Do you see how that works? So this curve is actually, we could call it a super margin of safety curve because it introduces more information than just normally what we see is that interaction curve on the, the graph. That is how we will handle stability of flat plates. It's important to master the concepts of this lecture. And if you are weak in the concepts of column buckling, study that arrow 3261 content to be sure you get that first. Then study this content until you get all this content because we're actually going to do a few more things. We're going to look at stability of curved panels. We're going to look at stability of cylinders. And we're going to use that to dispatch a wide number of aerospace stability problems. This is one of the very common analyses that you will need to do if you go into engineering structures of aerospace vehicles. Enjoy. That's all, folks.